We are talking tonight about the image of God in man, the imago dei, to use the Latin, um, which is one of those Latin terms that a lot of people who otherwise don't know Latin do recognize. Um, the image of God in man. It's one of these uh, fascinating details of Christian theology and uh, you know, of the first chapter of Genesis. You don't even get out of the first chapter of the Bible before you run into this idea that God created the human race, um, or at least the first man and woman, in his image and in his likeness. Um, so of course, questions arise, what does this mean? Are the image and likeness different things? Are they the same thing? Um, and then, especially when we come to the fall, what does this mean? Um, we have here uh, Adam and Eve in the paradisical state, uh, lording it over the animals in perfect peace. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no bridal, there's no threat. The lion likes being with Adam, right? Um, and they are in perfect peace in the garden. Of course, uh, the details of this are largely imagined. But, um, and then we have Cain and Abel. Okay, Cain and Abel is the next generation. Okay, Cain and Abel came from these people. How is that possible that in such a short time you go from king and queen, virtuous king and queen of the earth, the images of God on earth, to something like this happening, um, the very first human being that is born of woman is also the first murderer. Uh, it doesn't take long for the uh, effects of sin to make themselves felt. So the question is, what does this have to do with the image of God? Uh, is, if he's in the image of God, we can understand that. Is he also in the image of God? And the answers that we give to this end up uh, tying in all over theology, as if you've studied a little theology, you might expect. So I'm going to start out with uh, a few statements from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that being the Roman Catholic Church, but you can't expect them to uh, add that little qualifier in their own document. The divine image is present in every man. It shines forth in the communion of persons, in the likeness of the unity of the divine persons among themselves. So uh, this, just the fact that we are social beings, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, is an artifact of the image of God. Just as the persons of the Trinity have fellowship one with another, we have fellowship one with another. Not that, um, not that I have multiple persons within myself, but with you persons here, we have fellowship, and we eat meatballs, and we talk. Um, and that itself is said by the Catechism of the Catholic Church to be an, an evidence of the continuing image of God in man. And then the second one, by virtue of his soul and his spiritual powers of intellect and will, man is endowed with freedom, an outstanding manifestation of the divine image. So uh, the rest of uh, creation is subject to compulsion, subject to necessity. Animals do what they do because they are driven by instinct and the needs of their environment. Uh, animals do not have um, the ability to reason and weigh options and come up with some sort of a free choice the way that human beings do, or at least seem to. So uh, this, the free will, and then really all the intellectuality that leads up to, that goes into having a free will, the ability to have knowledge, to inform yourself, um, to uh, weigh pros and cons and make reasoned decisions, is a manifestation of the divine image. Um, and it makes sense, you know, if you're thinking in terms of, uh, well, what separates man from the rest of creation? This is a signal thing that separates man from the rest of creation. So when you read Genesis 1, and God makes man in the image and likeness of himself, well, it doesn't say that about anything else that he made. And so you see the connection, or you see one of the connections anyway, why they would identify this thing that is unique in men with the thing in Genesis 1 that is said to be unique of men, that they are made in the image and likeness of God. And now a uh, quotation from Rick Warren to show you that it's, uh, you know, to sort of get the spectrum here. God designed you in his image. Unlike all the other animals in the world, you are designed in God's image. Cows, goats, sheep, and ducks aren't designed in the image of God. You are. You can choose between right and wrong. You have a conscience, he means, and animals don't. 
You can talk to God, you can pray to God, animals can't do that. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 8, 5, you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Okay, so I, this is the same, uh, it's, it's kind of an expansion on the idea we had up here. Uh, you discover the image of God in man by comparing man to the rest of creation and seeing in what areas man surpasses the animals. And then that gives you some idea of what, um, what the image of God consists in. And uh, he goes a little bit further to talk about you, you can have a relationship with God. He doesn't use the R word, but you can talk to God, you can pray to God, um, you can know God. You know, why would God make a rational animal when he's already got all these other animals? Well, because he wants a creature that can know him and have a relationship with him the way the persons of the divine trinity have a relationship with themselves. And so the idea of the divine image is very widespread in, um, you know, very widespread and accepted in all branches of Christianity today. I mean, it's, it's one of the common coins that we have. So many other things divide the various uh, denominations. Um, but you can talk about the image of God in man and get a sage, and, you know, a sage nod and agreement from people all across the uh, theological spectrum. This is something we have in common, and we believe that man is made in the image of God, and this gives man, uh, this gives man a dignity and a worth that is objective and defined by God, not defined, you know, not given by a state, not given by a society. Um, this is a common suggested basis for Christian ethics across the confessional spectrum. Uh, that you uh, treat a man with dignity and a woman with dignity because they are made in the image of God. And that gives them special uh, worth that the animals and the rest of creation don't share in. So we Lutherans who uh, care about our confessions then run into an interesting uh, question when we run across some of the language in the Lutheran confessions. Uh, this is from the Apology. Um, it sounds like it's, uh, I'm sorry that we were disagreeing with you, Rome, but of course uh, it's not. It's the old usage of Apology, the defense. Um, the Augsburg Confession, after that was read to the emperor, it was the most ironic, the most peaceful, laid back sort of document that you can ever uh, imagine coming out of a serious disagreement. Uh, but the Roman confutation to it took issue with certain things, and then Melanchthon went back to his writing desk and came out with something considerably less roundabout and ironic, and that was the apology. So defending what they had said about original sin, we have said nothing new here. The traditional definition, rightly understood, says precisely the same thing when it states original sin is the absence of original righteousness. In the scriptures, this righteousness includes not only the second table of the Decalogue, that is the... Uh, Relations to your fellow men, uh, don't steal, don't kill, that kind of thing. But also the first, which requires fear of God, faith, and love of God. And this is, uh, well, I'll get to that in a sec. This original righteousness was intended to include not only a balanced physical constitution, but these gifts as well, a more certain knowledge of God, fear of God, and confidence in God, or at least the uprightness and power needed to do these things. And scripture affirms this when it says that humankind was formed in the image and likeness of God. What else does this mean except that a wisdom and righteousness that would grasp a God and reflect God was implanted in humankind? That is, humankind received gifts like the knowledge of God, fear of God, trust in God, and the like. Now, these gifts, knowledge of God, fear of God, trust in God, and the like, if this is what the image of God consists in, then we've already see, we already see the set you know, in volleyball, the set for the spike um, to, to the question, what is lost in the fall? In the original Augsburg Confession, the original um, that, that he's now defending when he's writing this, it defines original sin as being the, la the lack of original righteousness. And what this means, it means lack of fear of God, an absence of trust in God, and the presence of concupiscence, that is, um, fleshly desire of the kind that you've got to sit on or else you're going to do something wrong. So knowledge of God, fear of God, trust in God. We've got at least two of the elements that were identified as original sin 
in the original document, their opposites are being identified as what constitutes the image of God in this document. Solid declaration now of the formula of Concord, uh, the final Lutheran confessional document, harking back to the apology and summarizing what the apology has to say about original sin. Original sin is an entire want or lack of the concreated hereditary righteousness in paradise. That means the righteousness that was created along with Adam and Eve and put in them like an original operating system. Uh, or of God's image, according to which man was originally created in truth, holiness, and righteousness, and at the same time an inability and unfitness for all the things of God. So original sin is an entire want or lack of God's image. So it's saying that if we are fallen, which we are, uh, we're born in, a, born in sin from our parents, our first parents, Adam and Eve, that we are lacking the image of God. That original sin in human nature is not only this entire absence of all good and spiritual divine things, but also that instead of the lost image of God in man, it is at the same time also a deep, wicked, horrible, fathomless, inscrutable, and unspeakable corruption of the entire nature and all of its powers, especially of the highest principal powers of the soul in the understanding, heart, and will. The very elements of human psychology that our earlier definitions were pointing to that differentiate us from the animals and consist, make us consist in the image of God. So that now since the fall, man inherits an inborn wicked disposition and inward impurity of heart, evil lust and propensity. So we have uh, what seems to be a flat contradiction between this uh, common coin, what seems to be a common coin of Christian theology across the confessions, and some of the statements in the Lutheran confessional books uh, that everybody sharing the image of God and basing ethics on the image of God and all that sort of thing might have been okay if Adam and Eve had never sinned, but since that time we haven't had the image of God, and so all of this talk about the image of God is actually... Um, well, do we have to oppose it? Do we have to say, as Lutherans, I'm sorry, we don't have that anymore. Um, we, we, can't, we can't deal in those terms. Here we have Luther's lectures on Genesis. I am afraid that since the loss of this image through sin, so Luther is saying this too, we cannot understand it to any extent. Like, trying to explain what the image of God is. Well, if we still had the image of God, then we would know what it was. But since we've completely lost it, and our, uh, you know, we're, we're sinners, we're uh, fundamentally changed in our relationship to God and all things divine, we can't even guess what it was. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're guessing is really all that we can do. We haven't had no experience of it. Memory, will, and mind, there's those you know, human psychology again that, uh, that makes the image of God in some understandings. Memory, will, and mind we have indeed but they are most depraved and most seriously weakened. Yes, to put it more clearly, they are utterly leprous and unclean. If these powers are the image of God, it will also follow that Satan was created according to the image of God, since he surely has these natural endowments, such as memory and a very superior intellect, and a most determined will to a far higher degree than we have them. Therefore, the image of God is something far different, namely a unique work of God. If some assert nevertheless that these powers are that image, and here we go, we start to see maybe a, a possibility for a more complex understanding. If some assert nevertheless that these powers are that image, let them admit that they are, as it were, leprous and unclean. Similarly, we still call a leprous human being a human being, even though in his leprous flesh everything is almost dead and without sensation. So having said that the image of God is lost and that these powers that that prove the image of God and that anchor the image of God in the human nature still to this point are depraved and arguing that if that consists, if that gives us the image of God, then why doesn't it give it to Satan? He then concedes, well, if you do want to say that these powers are that image, at least admit that these powers that are that image are leprous and unclean. So we have an image of God that is leprous and unclean. And he says, you know, 
we call a human being who is, who is consumed by leprosy, we call him a human being, even though he's practically dead. So we could still call the image of God in that sense. So maybe the door is open a little bit, at least in Luther, although, of course, this is not a confessional document, um, to talk about the image of God in some way other than that it's gone. Here's uh, Francis Pieper, early 20th century Lutheran dogmatician. The Lutheran theologians are agreed, he's summarizing the tradition now, going back to the 16th century, that the image of God, which consists in the knowledge of God and holiness of the will, is lacking in man after the fall, since Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24, which we'll look at in a little bit, distinctly state that it's being restored in the believer. They differ, however, on the question as to whether in Genesis 9.6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God he made man. That's... Uh, the first time that capital punishment is stated by God, and God is um, saying that man needs to be killed for killing man because man's been made in the image of God. And this is definitely after the fall, or else he wouldn't have to be addressing murder at all. And James 3.9, with the tongue we curse men which are made after the similitude or likeness of God. So... Uh, Lutheran theologians differ on the question as to whether in these two verses a divine image is still ascribed to man after the fall. Some deny this and take the passages to describe man as the noble creature who once bore the image of God and in whom God would recreate this image through faith in Christ. Others say that these passages describe man as he is after the fall, a creature endowed with intellect and will, and contend that this constitutes a certain similitude with God. So we have in the Lutheran theological tradition in general a wider sense and a proper sense of the image of God. And this is something that you get with, uh, with, with other terms sometimes too. So the proper sense. Uh, this is uh, some quotations from the Lutheran dogmaticians from the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, this is uh, Quenstead. The image of God is a natural perfection consisting in an entire conformity with the wisdom, justice, immortality, and majesty of God, which was divinely concreated in the first man in order that he might perfectly know, love, and glorify God, his creator. So this is the proper understanding now. That, the way he's defined it there, that is definitely lost in the fall. So the proper understanding of the image of God, the proper definition of the image of God is that it is lost in the fall because it's those things. Um, con divinely concreated in the first man, original righteousness. And then original sin is defined as the lack of original righteousness. So if original righteousness is the image in this proper sense, then it must be gone now. And David Hollis, the perfections constituting the image of God were an intellect excelling in knowledge, perfect holiness, and freedom of the will absolute purity of the sensuous appetites and the most harmonious agreement of the affections with the decision of the intellect and guidance of the will in conformity with the wisdom, holiness, and purity of God as far as was consistent with the capacity of the first man. So, not just intellect, the fact that you have an intellect, but the fact that this intellect was all of these things. Excelling in knowledge and perfect holiness and freedom of the will Purity of the sensuous appetites, you know, so that you, you would never have to worry about being led astray by the desires of your body. Perfect harmony between the will and the desires of your body. So you didn't even have to fight um, the lusts. You know, you wouldn't even call them lusts in the modern spin that we put on that word. You would just call them, you know, good desires, innocent desires, because they never were a threat more than that. So you would have harmonious agreement of the affections with the intellect and the will instead of the war that we know within ourselves just from being human beings, from, from living, and that we see uh, memorably um, described in Romans 7, for instance. So if that is the image of God, if you understand that is the image of God in the proper sense, what they're calling the proper sense, then that's gone. But it gets technical. You, you, you thought it was technical already, didn't you? Um, it gets a little bit more technical. The image of God, this is quenched at again, specifically understood, is not to be sought for in those things which yet remain in man since the fall. 
So there it is explicitly that this image of God that we're talking about is gone. Whatever is still in man, that whatever you can still point to as, look, this is how human beings are different from animals, if you can still point to it, that's not the proper image of God. At least in the unregenerate. You, see, you, you will, in Christians, you'll start to see those things again. You'll start to see the first movements of that because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But you can't say it about the race in general. Because the image of God, having been lost through the disobedience of the first Adam, must be restored by a new creation through the obedience of the second Adam. And here we start to get to the New Testament rationale, which we're going to look at more extensively in a moment, for favoring this as the proper sense of image of God. Because Jesus Christ is also the image of God. And the new man is renewed in the image of God. There's a new creation that happens in the New Testament. Paul is again, an image clearly represents that of which it is an image. A vestige obscurely points to that of which it is a vestige. In all creatures are seen the vestiges of divine power, wisdom, and goodness. But in unfallen man, the image of God shone forth with full splendor. And here's where you start to see it really getting technical, right? Because all of these things that people point to and say, that's the image of God in man. Right? Um, we, we have uh, a moral sense. We are capable of love and fellowship and communion with one another. All of those things, um, Hollis is suggesting, well, sure, those are vestiges. Those are vestiges of the image of God. Those are vestiges of the original goodness. But you can't really call it an image anymore because it doesn't show you God anymore. It just shows you, like, the footprints of God. It just shows you, you know, like... There's a banana peel here, so we know somebody ate a banana peel here at some time in the past. That, that's the kind of thing it is. It's a vestige, it's not an image. And you can find vestiges all over the creation, not just in man. However, this opens up the possibility, you start to see how there can be a wider sense of image of God because these vestiges are being acknowledged now. <laughs> Okay, it gets really technical. Abraham Kalov. Inasmuch as the conformity of man to God as an archetype is found to be manifold, so there are many ways in which you can say man is like God, and in respect to this conformity, the image of God is variously defined by different persons, the following rules should be particularly observed lest we should here depart from the proper sense of the scriptures. This is why it's called the proper sense. How does scripture talk about the image of God specifically? And we'll make that the proper sense. But he's recognizing that there are other senses. That the conformity of man to God refers to the image of God, which having been impressed upon our first parents in creation and having been almost entirely lost through transgression, is to be restored by renovation in this life and chiefly in blessed regeneration for the life to come. Whence it is clear that the conformity to God, which is found in the substance of the soul, or of the body, does not belong to the image of God, which is described in the language of the scriptures. Because the substance of the soul or of the body was not destroyed by the fall, neither is it restored by renovation. So the substance of the soul or of the body, that is what everybody points to in, you know, across the religious spectrums when they talk about the image of God. They're talking about in the human constitution, um, whether it's uh, the Augustinian idea that the human psychology reflects the divine trinity, the persons of the divine trinity, or the things that we read from the Catholic Catechism and Rick Warren on the first slide, all of these things are in fact a ki kind of conformity to God, but it's not the kind of conformity to God that scripture, consider that scripture specifically calls the image of God. So, when the confessions say, at least you know, according to these theologians, um, when, the, uh, when the confessions say that we have lost the image of God, it doesn't mean that we have to go on the warpath against, uh, against those quotations from the first slide or else, you know, in order to be good confessional Lutherans. Uh, it means that we have lost the image of God in this sense that is the proper sense that Scripture has a theme. Scripture has a theme of the image of God and it appears at the beginning and it appears with Christ. It's lost and it's regained. Uh, the, cre the first creation dies, the second creation is re you know, recreated. Um, in Christ, uh, 
how does that quotation go? In Christ, neither Jew nor Gentile avail, but a new creation. I'm not sure I had the first half of that right, but the second half was right, the, the new creation. Um, so these other conformities in the substance of the soul would be the wider sense of the image of God. Wider because it's not the explicitly scriptural sense. And then, yeah, uh, this is just the... Um, I already highlighted that the first time I showed that slide, so that's why I have that in there. Luther acknowledging that you maybe could use the word image in this other sense as long as you recognize that the image is pretty trashed. Okay, and another from Luther from lectures on Genesis. Even though this image has been almost completely lost, almost completely lost, there is still a great difference between a human being and the rest of the animals. Before the coming of sin, the difference was far greater and more evident when Adam and Eve knew God and all the creatures and, as it were, were completely engulfed by the goodness and justice of God. And he goes on to talk about the dominion of Adam in the garden and how the, the dominion that we have over animals now is a pale shadow of what he imagines uh, must have been in the garden because part of the curse is that the fear of the beast shall be upon you. Um, you know, and God brought the beast to Adam so he could name them. It, it sounds like, you know, that picture we had in the first, the very first slide with uh, the lion hanging out with Adam, that's not just an artist's imagination that is based on, you know, hints in the text of what Eden might have been like before the fall. So, uh, you know, he said uh, back then man had perfect dominion. Man was, you know, God's regent on earth. Man said jump and the lion said how high? Uh, it's not like now where you, you can outwit the lion or you can beat the lion with technology or whatever, but um, if you are on the lion's turf, you're toast. It's not like that. Therefore, even now, by the kindness of God, this leprous body has some appearance of the dominion over the other creatures, but it is extremely small and far inferior to that first dominion when there was no idea of skill or cunning, when the animal simply obeyed the divine voice because Adam and Eve were commanded to have dominion over them. So almost completely lost, and he's still talking about you know, that, that we have a little bit of this dominion left, right? A leprous image. Now here are those two verses that Pieper sing, signaled out as the reason for this being the proper sense. The image of God is lost in the fall. That's the proper sense because of these two verses, he says. Colossians 3, 9 to 10. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. Okay, putting off the old man, there's the, uh, the death of Adam in you, and having put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So this is uh, in Greek, icon. And uh, you recognize the, the word icon in English too. Uh, I noticed there are some very nice icons in the, in the church um, in the sanctuary and also in the narthex, uh, including uh, Our Lady of the Water Fountain, I noticed. Um, <laughs> or Our Lady of the Water Fountain on the left. There was another one on the Water Fountain on the right. But uh, that's where the word icon comes from in that application, too. Um, and we'll see that showing up a little bit later also. So the new man is renewed in knowledge. So remember, there's been a big emphasis in the image of God that was lost on the knowledge, the perfect knowledge and harmony with God after the image of him that created him. So of him that created him, the, the, uh, it's obviously plugging into Genesis 1 here. We are created in the image in the first place, and now we are renewed according to the image of the creator again. It's a new creation, a new image. And then Ephesians 4, 22 to 24 that you've put off concerning the former convert conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So this just says after God, katafeon now, it, it leaves out icon, but the, uh, it, mean, it means the same thing, especially when you compare the two epistles to each other, the two passages. He's clearly saying, making the same point in both of them. And this new man is created. So it's a new creation. And that is why they're saying that this is the proper sense. Now, one way of, 
One way of uh, talking about this now, because wider sense and proper sense is it's kind of confusing language. I go into this um, to explain to you how it is that the, uh, that the confessions can say that the image is lost, but we don't have to go after Rick Warren for what he said about the image of God. Um, you know, there might be other things he says about the image of God that we would have to go after him for, but uh, you know, I, I think that what he said on the, on the early slide was acceptable. We talk about narrow or proper and then wider sense. It seems like we could have a, a better way of talking about this, a way that's a little bit more easy to understand, a way that's also more biblical, if we talked about image and likeness of God. Okay, He's made, He made Adam and Eve in the image and likeness of God. So this is something that was done in... Um, in, in Christian history, uh, Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus had started experimenting with it a little bit, distinguishing between the image and the likeness, and saying that you need both of them to be in, you know, in good shape for man to be the proper image of God. So Luther, in his lectures on Genesis, responds to people who do this. Similitude is, is that, that's exactly the same word as likeness. It's just uh, Latin instead of Germanic. Um, moreover, they say that the similitude or likeness lies in the gifts of grace. Just as a similitude is a certain perfection of an image, so they say our nature is perfected through grace. And if you, uh, if you studied any uh, Aquinas, that's like the, um, the governing idea in the theology of Thomas Aquinas, that uh, nature is perfected by grace. Nature is good, grace is better. So, uh, and so the similitude of God consists in this, that the memory is provided with hope, and the intellect with faith, and the will with love. So in other words, you could have a guy who has the image of God, and he's got memory and intellect and will, which are these classical sort of Aristotelian parts of the human psychology. He's got those, but his, he's not doing good things with them. Uh, his memory, he doesn't have any hope of salvation. He doesn't have any faith in his intellect. Uh, his will is not governed by love, but rather by selfish desires and um, lusts. So you can say there that he has the image in that he has these elements, but he doesn't have um, the graces that give those elements good content. So it's sort of like you've got a powerful computer, um, state-of-the-art computer that's uh, fast and has just tons of memory, but you've got a terrible operating system on it. You know, you've got the, the latest, but you've got Windows 3.1 on it for some reason. Um, in this way, they say, a man was created in the image of God, that is, he has mind, memory, and will. Likewise, man is created according to the similitude of God. Okay, that's kind of repeating what he said. And uh, this, at the beginning, just as a similitude is a certain perfection of an image. So, you know, you can say, uh, if you draw a picture of somebody, someone can say, oh, that actually looks like me. That's what that is. You know, there is not all pictures of, you know, if I draw a picture of Pastor Cooper, it's not going to be as good as if somebody in here who actually has artistic talent draws a picture of Pastor Cooper. Um, they, they, we might have two images of him, but the likeness is going to be significantly better in one case. Moreover, they say that the similitude lies in the gifts of grace. Um, okay, they contribute. Okay, there we go. Although these not unattractive speculations point conclusively to keen and leisurely minds, they contribute very little to the correct explanation of the image of God. So Luther lays it all out, and I like how he's laying it out, and then he just throws it out the window. And this does not really help us understand the image of God. Therefore, although I do not condemn or find fault with that effort and those thoughts by which everything is brought into relationship with the Trinity, because he was talking about, about that also. This is uh, St. Augustine's famous, um, in his work on the Trinity, he said, well, in order to try to understand the Trinity, perhaps we can, make some, we can get some mileage out of the fact that man was created in the image of God. You know, if, I, if I look within myself, maybe I can find some sort of image of God from how he created me. And um, he actually is able to do this rather, rather convincingly with the principle that the Son, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is the Logos of the Father. 
because he's the word, that means he's the word of the Father, but the Greek word didn't just mean like a phoneme or something spelled on paper. Uh, it wasn't just something you looked up in a dictionary, it was also reason and thought and like everything that went into speaking a word in the first place in a rational sense. Uh, the word logic comes from logos, so you can easily see. So uh, the idea is that he's, he's the logos of God, that he is the thought of God. He is the mind of God. God the Father is completely unknowable, like as unknowable in his own self as, as ever the Gnostics said that God was. But the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has revealed him to us. He is the image of the invisible God. Um, he is the mind of God revealed to us. When God speaks to us, he speaks the Son. And so Augustine said, well, we have this relationship with our thoughts too. You know, I, I have a thought, and it, the, the thought um, reveals my mind, even to myself. Like Until I actually think it out, I don't know, I don't know what my opinion on something is until I think it out. You know, uh, and then when you write it, you know even better. Francis Bacon, writing makes an exact man, right? Um, I didn't even realize I understood this as well as I did until I had to explain it to somebody, you know. Uh, so your thought um, is words. And you, have, you, you as the thinker have a relationship to your own thought, which is analogous at some lower level of reality to the relationship between God and the Son. Um, or at least that is what we're invited to uh, think and guess on the basis of the fact that St. John calls him the Logos of the Father. And then the Spirit, the Spirit doesn't work quite as well, um, but he said um, that the, the Spirit is, uh, since the Spirit is the Spirit of the Father, but Scripture also calls him the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Son, that the Spirit is something that they share, and the Spirit is the, is the relationship between them, is the love between them. Um, when you, when you uh, love your own thought and you say, yes, that is true, and you recognize it, then that is sort of analogous to the experience of the, you know, on a lower level of reality and not intended to actually explicate what happens in the Trinity, but it comes about as close as you can. That was Augustine's theory. And this was, uh, that's what he's saying here. I do not condemn or find fault with that effort by which everything is brought into relationship with the Trinity. But I am not sure that these things are very useful, especially when they are subsequently spun out further. For there is also added a discussion concerning free will, which has its origin in that image. This is what they maintain. God is free. Therefore, since man is created according to the image of God, he also has a free memory, mind, and will. In this way, many statements are carelessly made, statements that are either not properly expressed or later on understood in a wicked way. And so this is what he's getting at here. You know, that's all well and good. These speculations about the image of God, they, they may, you know, they're, they're attractive intellectually. Um, I don't have a problem with them to a point, but I don't sure, I'm not sure they're very useful, actually, because they have all these pitfalls that you start looking for these likenesses of, your, of the soul to God, and you start saying, my will must be free because God's will is free, and you start coming to all these conclusions that we have seen just wreck Christian theology and that I've had to make a whole career fighting. Um, so an interesting take by, by Luther there, rejecting the traditional language of image because of how it's been abused, I suppose, because of how it's been abused by the scholastics. So two reasons, well, three reasons, I didn't edit that apparently, three reasons to say that the image of God has been lost. The new man that we put on in baptism is created and renewed after the image of God. If we need a new image, that implies we don't have the old one anymore. Two, the new man or new image is renewed in the knowledge of God and created in righteousness and true holiness. Original sin is the absence of these traits, knowledge and righteousness and true holiness especially. So if we need to get knowledge and righteousness and original sin is the absence of those things, then the image really is the opposite of what original sin is. If we have original sin, we don't have the image. And three, if he believes that a functioning image remains, this is the one Luther just dealt with, man might rely on its powers to recommend himself to God and help himself save himself. But we have all this language about the vestiges, the remnants of knowledge, and a conformity to God in the substance of the soul. 
So now it's time for the uh, C.S. Lewis quotation. Um, not, a, not a Lutheran, of course, but a, a very good mind. A statue has the shape of a man, but it's not alive. In the same way, man has, in a sense I'm going to explain, the shape or likeness of God, but he's not got the kind of life God has. Let us take the first point first, man's resemblance to God. Everything, man, everything God has made has some likeness to himself. Space is like him in its hugeness. Not that the greatness of space is the same kind of greatness as God's, but it's a sort of symbol of it, or a translation into non-spiritual terms. Matter is like God in having energy, though again, of course, physical energy is a different kind of thing from the power of God. The vegetable world is like him because it is alive, and he is the living God. But life in this biological sense is not the same as the life there is in God. It's only a kind of symbol or shadow of it. When we come on to the animals, we find other kinds of resemblance in addition to biological life. In the higher mammals, we get the beginnings of instinctive affection, which is not the same thing as the love that exists in God, but it is like it, rather in the way that a picture drawn on a flat piece of paper can nevertheless be like a landscape. When we come to man, the highest of the animals, we get the completest resemblance to God that we know of. So this is kind of a statement, a restatement of the general Catholic, you know, across the confessions, a comprehension of the image of God that... All of creation, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? All of creation tells you something about the creator, and nothing tells you more about the creator than a human, than a human being. And so that could be the reason to say that he has the image of God in a way that the rest of creation doesn't. So this image and likeness, I, I like this way of talking about it. Peeper doesn't. Some assume that the image signifies man's mind and will, and the likeness a mind that knows God and a will in agreement with God's will. This interpretation contradicts scripture, he says. For in verse 27, which reports the execution of verse 26, only image is used. Now since the divine execution surely agrees with the divine resolution, that is, the resolution is let us make man in our own image and the execution is actually doing it, image by itself includes the whole of the divine image and likeness. So this is what he's talking about. Um, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. It even says it twice, right? Like there's, there's a space where they could have repeated image if, if, if Moses wanted to repeat it, and he didn't. He said image twice, or he could have said likeness, but he says image twice instead. So uh, something in the translation there. God says, let us make man in our tselem, after our demuth. That is the Hebrew. So God created man in his own tselem, in the tselem of God created he him. And then in the Septuagint is icon, for Tselem is icon, and homo homoiosis is likeness. So uh, the demuth is the homoiosis in the Septuagint. And then in the Septuagint, so God created man in his own icon. It doesn't even say it twice. I'm not sure why. Um, it just says, so God created man in his own icon. So uh, Peeper's argument here is that if they were different things, they would not be able to be summed up just by saying image in the very next verse. Um, but I don't think that's a very good argument because especially if your argument is that likeness is an attribute of an image, you know, likeness is something that an image has to some degree, uh, then you can't make an image without also making a likeness if, if you take that understanding. Now, if you take them really as two different things, then he's got an, an argument. But if you understand the likeness as an attribute of the image, as a degree to which the image succeeds in imaging the thing it's trying to image, then um, yeah, I don't think it's a strong argument. And then we have these other uses. Uh, I put these first two up here to show you that Genesis does not use these terms in a technical sense, OK? In the likeness of God made he him in the day that God created man. So that's a demuth, okay, which is just like likeness back in chapter one. But the Septuagint renders it icon now instead of homoiosis. So the Septuagint, at least, is seeing a difference here. That, um, so in the likeness of God or in the image of God. Here in just two verses later, Adam lived 150 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. So I think this is a clue to what's meant when God creates man in his image and in his likeness. Um, that he, uh, well, you know, it's like 
uh, Luke, when St. Luke gives his genealogy of uh, the Christ. He takes it all the way back to Adam, and how does he cap off that genealogy? He says, Adam, the son of God. And so like, Adam is, in a sense, the divine offspring, and um, his own offspring now is also begot in his own likeness and after his image. But we've got here in the likeness and after the image. Whereas in Genesis 1, when God makes man, we have in the image and after the likeness. And so that, that sort of discourages you from trying to read anything technical into the prepositions, uh, which uh, some of the theologians tried to do anyway. Um, but the, uh, the likeness and the image are not always used the same way. Like here, it just says demuth. In the, in the demuth of God, he made him to sum up the whole thing. And in Genesis 1, when it summed up the whole thing, it said in the tselem. So it, it seems like they can use these words interchangeably. And that's probably why the Septuagint goes with icon as a translation of demuth, because it was icon the first time they summed it up with just one word. All that to just say that Pieper is right, that you can't, you can't prove from Genesis that there is a dogmatic distinction between those two Hebrew words. And you can't make the point based on that. But then we've got this, Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And this is Selim, an icon again. So this is capital punishment commanded not because you have taken away a life from that man, not because of all the things he's not able to do with the rest of his life, not because his loved ones need him and miss him and uh, his children are going to starve without him and all the reasons that we would come up with for justifying capital punishment. This is a cultic reason for capital punishment, uh, not meaning having to do with an occult thing, but meaning having to do with worship. Man is the image of God. If you lift your hand against a man and strike him down and do damage to him, you are profaning the image of God. You know, just like uh, taking a crap in the temple. You are profaning the image of God. And uh, that is why it's death penalty associated with it. So that suggests that there still is an image of God in man. Now here's Luther's understanding of that. Uh, which Pieper likes. This is the outstanding reason why he does not want a human being killed on a strength of individual discretion. This is Luther commenting on that verse. Man is the noblest creature, not created like the rest of the animals, but according to God's image. Even though man has lost this image through sin, as we stated above, his condition is nevertheless such that it can be restored through the word and the Holy Spirit. God wants us to show respect for this image in one another. He does not want us to shed blood in a tyrannical manner. So uh, the understanding of some of the theologians and of Pieper here is that what Luther means by this is that it is, he is still considered to have the image of God in respect of the future plan that God has for him. Since God is planning to save the human race, to send a second Adam to set right with the first Adam um, messed up, then in virtue of that future act that God plans to do, and for the sake of Christ, God considers man to still have this cultic image that he's actually lost. It's a little bit tortured, um, and I'm not sure that Luther does actually mean that because, uh, because he's talking also about the image being almost totally lost. So when he says his condition is such that it can be restored, he might actually be talking about the vestiges of the image of God that can be renewed, because you know, the New Testament uses that language too, not just a new creation, but a renewal, which suggests something already there being fixed. And then there's this, James 3.9. This is the other one that Pieper mentioned as a problem for, the, for, the, for saying that the image is gone from man. With a tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. This is the same kind of usage that we saw with the, com with the commandment for capital punishment back in Genesis. Um, you are, so you're, perfectly pious toward God, but you're vilifying your fellow man who is made in, a, in the image and likeness of God. So you are, uh, you are worshiping God to his face, but you are violating his image. You are showing blasphemy by this cult, in this cultic sense. And then there's also this one, which people didn't mention. This, this is more direct. You couldn't make a sedes out of this, more indirect. 
But this famous event where Jesus said, they asked him, is it lawful to pay tax to Caesar? Because Caesar is a pagan ruler, you know, and we're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to give this kind, of, this kind of worship and consideration only to God. Well, he says, whose likeness and inscription is on the coin? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And I think what he's implying here is you, yourselves, are the coin that has God's image on it. This coin belongs to Caesar. He issued it. If he wants to have it back, you can't say no. But that doesn't mean that you're giving him more consideration than you're giving God. Because you yourself have the image of God on you, and you need to render your whole life, your whole self, to God as your proper worship. And they marveled. And usually we uh, consider that to be you know, the way he gets them to say, oh, that's Caesar's image, and provide the opening for him to say, yeah, give it to Caesar. But he also does this turn, and to God, the things that are God's. And you know, he's talking to Jews, you know, that they know their Genesis 1. They know that they're made in the image of God. And so I think that we could consider that more evidence of the Bible talking actually as if the image is still there. All right. Everybody knows who this is, right? I'm not going to get like attacked for showing it in North South Carolina. Um, I went to a uh, a couple Lincoln Institute. Um, there were days when people who had written books on Lincoln would uh, come to the National Archives and give papers on them. And one of them was about how Lincoln was like now uni universally um, considered to be a hero in all parts of the country. So I think I'm safe. Um, <laughs> you don't think I'm safe. All right. Well, uh, oh, you did that with the powers of your mind, didn't you? <laughs> Got away from the. Okay, we have here a photograph of Lincoln. That is as good an image as you're going to get of Lincoln. You know, photography's gotten better since his day, but he hasn't been alive since then. So this is an image of Lincoln that has a high degree of likeness. Then we have this one. Obviously, using this photograph as a model, but somebody has drawn a copy of that photograph. So it's still an image of Lincoln, but it's got less likeness. Now we've got just a line drawing not based on a photograph, or at least not the same photograph, a little bit less degree of likeness, but still an image of Lincoln. Now we got this. This is like, this guy's 10. Okay, he's 10, and he put on a beard for a school play, but it's still an image of Lincoln. You, you look at that, you, you know who it is. You don't say, um, Ben Franklin. Right, you know, you know that's Lincoln. It's still recognizable, right? Maybe just because of the stovepipe hat and the mutton chops, but uh, no one's going to say it's Jack the Ripper. That's Lincoln. And here we have Stickman Lincoln. And Stickman Lincoln is still perfectly recognizable. Of course, it helps that he's quoting, or you know, that they're talking about. Lincoln and Stephen Douglas and quoting from the Gettysburg Address, all that context helps. But if you just saw that stick man, you would still guess Abraham Lincoln. Because Abraham Lincoln is a cultural icon, right? Um, there aren't many people who would be so recognizable reduced to stick man. Uh, but he is. He definitely is. Very little likeness, right? There aren't even any features on that face. And yet it's still an image of Abraham Lincoln. So this is my illustration of the way in which image and likeness can be, can be correlated without being different things. And now we've got to get some of the fathers in here because, uh, well, you know, I'm a patristics guy, and they have some really good things to say about this subject. St. Augustine on the image, God made man in his own image. He created for him a soul endowed with reason and intelligence. There. He made man in his own image for he created for him a soul endowed with reason and intelligence, so that he might excel all the creatures of the earth, air, and sea, which were not so gifted. So we have in here the element of comparison that arrested the creation that we've seen in other places, and the reason and intelligence being specifically 
the things that are identified as the constitutional image of God in man. So that's from City of God. And then when he talks about the fall in the Enchiridion, he calls man the being who rebelled against God, who in the abuse of his freedom spurned and transgressed the command of his creator when he could so easily have kept it, who defaced in himself the image of his creator by stubbornly turning away from his light, who by an evil use of his free will broke away from his wholesome bondage to the creator's laws. And it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to accuse Augustine of being a guy who didn't take the effects of the fall seriously. Augustine took the effects of the fall seriously, and he is still talking about the image of God being defaced instead of lost. And this is the uh, effects of this. What but disobedience was the punishment of disobedience in that sin? For what else is man's misery but his own disobedience to himself? So that in consequence of his not being willing to do what he could do, that is then in the garden, he now wills to do what he cannot. For who can count how many things he wishes which he cannot do, so long as he is disobedient to himself? That is, so long as his mind and his flesh do not obey his will. For in spite of himself, his mind is both frequently disturbed and his flesh suffers and grows old and dies. And in spite of ourselves, we suffer whatever else we suffer, and which we would not suffer if our nature absolutely and in all of its parts obeyed our will. By the just retribution of the sovereign God, whom we refuse to be subject to and serve, our flesh, which was subjected to us, now torments us by insubordination. He is not in need of our service, as we are of our bodies. And therefore, what we did to him, that is, was no punishment to him, but what we receive is a punishment to us. So this is his understanding now of what the, in what the fall what the fall is constituted in. It's not in the image being lost, it's rather in the halves of the image turning against each other. So the reason does not control the whole person anymore. Like, you don't want to do always what you should do, but even when you do want to do what you should do, a la Romans 7, it's still an awful struggle. And you can't simply by you know, mind over matter, as the psalmist says, add a single day to your life. Um, so, uh, That is what the fall involves, according to Augustine. And now St. Athanasius, his uh, On the Incarnation of the Word is uh, just the most, the most sublime treatise. Uh, if, if you want to read just like something from the church fathers, uh, like maybe you haven't read anything or maybe you've read just a little bit, St. Athanasius, On the Incarnation of the Word, there's a nice little um, slender English uh, translation of it put up by St. Vladimir's Press, and it even has a foreword written by C.S. Lewis, which is also great in its own right, and um, actually it's out of copyright now, so you can, you can find it for free on the internet, too. Um, Grudging existence to none, therefore, we're talking about the original creation, he made all things out of nothing through his own word, our Lord Jesus Christ. And of all these, his earthly creatures, he reserved a special mercy for the race of men. Upon them, therefore, upon men, who as animals were essentially impermanent, he bestowed a grace which other creatures lacked, namely the impress of his own image, a share in the reasonable being of the very word himself. So that reflecting him and themselves becoming reasonable and expressing the mind of God even as he does, though in limited degree, they might continue forever in the blessed and only true life of the saints in paradise. And now we see, if you weren't starting to see already, the explicit connection between reason being identified as the image of God and, well, it's got scriptural basis. This is not just based on comparing to the animals and saying, oh, man can reason and dogs can't. The word of God, the logos of God, the reason of God, the mind of God, is the one through whom all things were made, is the Lord Jesus Christ, who, as we'll, we'll look at a few passages on one of these slides coming up, is called the image of God, the image of God expressly in the New Testament multiple times. So if we were originally made in the image of God, um, this is something uh, Origen, I think Origen might have been the first person to, to say this, Man made in the image of God means he's made in the image of the Logos because the Logos is the image of God. Um, he is the one who makes God visible, who reveals God. So uh, if, uh, if it is because of a share in the word of God 
that we have the image, then the image must be something to do with words and reason and, you know, the ability to be a rational person and have some kind of a personal relationship with God and other rational persons. And now we talk about the fall. How could men be reasonable beings if they had no knowledge of the word and reason of the Father through whom they had received their being? They would be no better than the beasts had they no knowledge save of earthly things. But in fact, the good God has given them a share in his own image, that is, in our Lord Jesus Christ, and has made even themselves after the same image and likeness. But as we have already seen, men turned away from God. They defiled their own soul so completely that they not only lost their apprehension of God, but invented for themselves other gods of various kinds. So you know, that is idolatry is mankind on the way to the animals. This is a theme running through the fathers, and they got it from scripture, right? There's that, uh, that famous passage in, where the prophet deconstructs the worship of idols and says, you know, this man, he cuts down a tree out of his own labor and he drags it home out of his own labor and he fashions it into an image out of his own labor and then he bows down in front of it as if this thing that he has exercised full control and, and over is, is now able to uh, give him some sort of help. So idolatry is a sign that the human race was going away from God, away from a rational worship of their true creator, going to the beasts. And then, as then, the creatures, on whom, the creatures whom he had created reasonable to be like the word were in fact perishing and such noble works were on the road to ruin. What then was God being good to do? Was he to let corruption and death have their way with them? In that case, what was the use of having made them in the beginning? What then was God to do? How else could he what else could he possibly do, being God, but renew his image in mankind, so that through it men might once more come to know him? And how could this be done, save by the coming of the very image himself, our Savior Jesus Christ? Man could not have done it, for they are only made after the image. Like that point that Origen made, um, that we were made in the image, not to be the image. Nor could angels have done it, for they are not the images of God. And he doesn't explain why, which is too bad. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end, but that sort of gets to Luther's argument that the devil has the same intellectual endowments that we do, and we don't say he was made in the image of God. The image of the Father only was sufficient for this need. Here is an illustration to prove it. You know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains? The artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the panel has to come and sit for it again, and then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. Even so was it with the all-holy Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself and seek out his lost sheep, even as he says in the gospel, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. So what we have here in the Fathers, um, in Augustine and Athanasius, and I could multiply examples, is uh, another proper scriptural use of image, right? The, uh, the Lutheran um, doctrinal tradition is pointing to the proper use being the image that was lost, the, whole, the actual holiness rather than the theoretical constitutional ability to be holy. Original righteousness is the image in the proper sense on the basis of those verses in the New Testament that talk about the image being renewed in us through baptism, through um, incorporation into Jesus Christ. But this is also something that the New Testament does. And here we go. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's icon. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Icon again, and then in Hebrews, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Talking about Christ. And there are the words, not icon, but character. But the idea is the same. Um, it's, it's used in a way that's synonymous to icon. And so this also is a proper usage of the word image. And uh, the one in whom we are remade is also the one in whom we were made originally, through whom we were made originally, the word of God. And uh, 
So it makes sense that the image of God would have something to do with the word of God, the rationality of God, the personality of God, basically this broad understanding of image of God, the wider understanding of the image of God, through these verses actually I think has a claim to be also a proper understanding of the image of God. So I've shown this one already. Some deny that there's a continuing image and take the passages to describe man as a noble creature who once bore and who would bear it again. Others say that these passages describe man as he is after the fall, a creature endowed with intellect and will and contend that this constitutes a certain similitude with God. I'm definitely on, on that side of things. The latter distinguish between the image of God in a wider sense, according to which man, in distinction from the animals, is still a rational being even after the fall, and the divine image in a proper sense, consisting in true knowledge and service of God, which was lost through the fall. It will be seen that these two interpretations do not differ materially, since Luther and those who agree with him do not deny that man after the fall retains his intellect and will, right? Really, in a sense, it's a semantic argument. Are you going to call intellect and will that everybody agrees man retains? Are you going to call it the image of God? And those, who, and those who agree with him, and Bayer and those who agree with him, do not deny that man has, through the fall, completely lost the wisdom and original righteousness. However, the interpretation of Luther is to be preferred. <laughs> and he doesn't say why. It's just how the paragraph ends, and he goes on to something else. So, so to go back to these objections, to say that the image of, uh, three reasons to say that the image of God has been lost. The new man that we put on in baptism is created and renewed after the image of God. If we need a new image, that implies we don't have the old one anymore. Well, or, as Athanasius said, if we need a new image, it might be that the old image is blackened and so you can barely see it. Um, and it's marred and defaced. The new man or image is renewed in the knowledge of God and righteousness and true holiness, whereas original sin is the absence of those traits especially. Well, we can say that original sin is the absence of those traits especially without saying that original, that, that original righteousness is the image of God. Right? Original righteousness doesn't have to be the whole image of God in order for original sin to be characterized by these missing pieces. That's just why the likeness is so bad. And if he believes that a functioning image remains, man may rely on its powers to recommend himself to God and to help to save himself. He may. Um, but man doesn't need any excuses to do that. He can abuse this doctrine, but you know, Augustine gives us an example of somebody who did not abuse the doctrine in that way and manfully went, went after people who were abusing the doctrine in that way. And now I close with my, with my best Chemnitz, Martin Chemnitz, um, before the age of orthodoxy, this was the guy who wrote a, a large part of the formula of Concord. When man was created, God made him in the divine image and added the knowledge which admonishes man to do just, good, and proper works. He also gave man a free will. After the fall of our first parents, these good attributes were marred. Although in this corruption of our nature, the image of God has been so deformed that the knowledge of him does not shine forth like it did, yet the knowledge does remain but our heart contends against it, and our doubts arise because of certain things which seem to conflict with this knowledge. And he gives the example you know, about how everyone doubts when he prays. You know, Jesus didn't doubt when he prayed. Jesus was a perfect man. When, when he prayed, he knew his father would take care of him, and he had no doubt about it whatsoever. But everybody who is a sinner doubts when he prays. He still has enough knowledge of God to pray, but he has all these other things that he sees that seem to conflict with the possibility that God will answer his prayer. And he says, I can't really be sure. I'm just throwing up a Hail Mary here. <laughs> Yet the natural knowledge of God is not entirely extinct. Paul is citing this law of nature in Romans 1 and explaining it. It is obvious that it is in agreement with the first commandment, and to this touchstone may be referred the discussion of Xenophon, Cicero, and men like them who followed their natural judgment and taught and often defended this law in opposition to atheists. So the natural law that even the pagans were, you know, the, the better pagans were able to grasp and expound upon, the natural law is itself a remnant of the knowledge of God. Um, 
And uh, therefore, even if you say that the knowledge of, uh, that the image of God consists in content, right, operating system, instead of constitution, architecture of the human psyche, even if you say that, that's not all gone either. Now, uh, to say that we still have the image of God is, um, you know, it's open to all of these uh, possibilities for abuse. We still have the image of God. Oh, well, great. I just got to be good. I just got to, like, exercise those natural gifts of, of, uh, of nature, and I will uh, recommend myself to God, and I'll be saved. And, you know, Pelagius can run with that, and this is what we're going to be talking about tomorrow morning. Um, so when we say, you know, image of God, you still have the image of God, but it's marred, but it's defaced, this is going to seem too weak to a lot of Lutherans. It's going to seem too weak. Oh, it's not quite as good as it used to be. Yeah, you're still giving yourself way too much credit. Um, and the example I gave with the Lincolns, you know, a photograph of Lincoln degenerates until it's just a stick man. And, you know, you can see, okay, yeah, I, ident I recognize there's a lot of likeness that's been lost between the beginning and the end of there. But I still don't feel like you're taking this seriously enough. You know, like uh, that stick man is not scary to me. That stick man is not a tragedy to me. It's just funny. Um, you have communicated that likeness can be largely gone and the image still remain. But I don't feel like you're actually picturing original sin and the ravages thereof. Well, here I have a TV father. Michael Landon playing Pa Ingalls from the old Little House in the Prairie series. Um, strong, courageous, loving, perfect dad, like as perfect as the script writers could make him. And played, you know, played very uh, believably by Michael Landon. Uh, that is a father. That, that is an image of a father with a great deal of likeness also. Here's another father. Okay? Also a father. Has all the same claims to being a father, biologically, and you know, in terms of the family structure, and you know, he's the one who's in charge of the discipline, although sometimes he wants to do it with an ax, apparently. Um, he is a father, but there's, oh, there's something missing. There is a vast absence and likeness between these two. And you might say that quantitatively, the likeness between these two is much greater than the likeness between the photograph and the stick figure. But now you see the illustration, you know, what, what a little bit of absence can do to turn an angel into a demon. Uh, something C.S. Lewis said that I particularly like. There are a lot of such things. Um, one does not make, uh, see, one does not make a devil out of a failed human. One makes devils out of failed archangels. <laughs> the higher something starts, the more there is that can go wrong. And, uh, you know, the animals don't have a problem with this. <laughs> um, okay, some animals, I guess, do kill their young. But most animals don't have a problem with this. An animal doesn't suddenly go crazy and uh, take an ax and start hunting down the people that are nearest and dearest to it. It might get rabid and attack all comers, but because human beings are made so special and in the image of God and to be so righteous, when they go wrong, it can be especially horrible. And there's, a, there's an image for you, an image with a great deal of likeness lost. But it's still an image of the guy who put it up. And uh, the question of whether there is a visible, physical element to the image. If I get into that, we're, gonna, we're not going to have time for questions. Um, but uh, let, me, let me just say quickly that uh, the fact that man is a creature that can be seen and interacted with physically is part of the image also. Because this is not true of the angels. The angels, they have all of those mental and spiritual attributes that are more impressive than what we have in the current state, much more impressive than what we have. Some of them, the devil even has more than we have, as Luther pointed out. But they're not the image of God. Why are they not the image of God? Because they are invisible. 
They are not physical. They cannot be seen by the rest of the creation. And uh, man is put on earth as the image of God. That's the whole point. The physical creation is all visible. This is the capstone of the physical creation. This will be my region on earth. This will be my representative. This is the image of God. And the angels were not given that job. And the angels were not given a body to carry that out. And so uh, we can talk more about that if you ask questions about it. But I better stop talking so that somebody can ask a question. I have a question, Tom. Compare this to total depravity given two versus Lutheran understanding of depravity. I think, uh, I think as far as the tea and tulip goes, uh, what we, we basically have the same understanding as, as the Calvinists because they don't, uh, total depravity sounds like everybody's Jack Nicholson running around with an ax, um, but the first thing they say when they, uh, when they explain what they mean by that is this does not mean that everybody is as bad as they possibly can be. It means that every part of the human psyche and the body, every part of the human person has been affected, has been twisted and corrupted by original sin. You can't say, oh sure, the lusts of the flesh are crazy out of control, but I still have this will, I still have this free will by which I can please God. So when I say total, they mean uh, extent throughout all parts of the psyche, not, not that everybody is a serial killer. Yes? Yeah, I want to hear more about uh, what, what you just mentioned at the end. You just made a brief comment about uh, the physical nature of man and uh, being a God's representative on earth. And I know that uh, John Chrysostom and some other of the church fathers um, largely see the image in, in man's kingship, his authority mm -hmm. uh, in the garden. Um, and and uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because it sounds like you're, you're taking kind of that perspective. Yeah. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let him have dominion. It's the very next, the very next statement. Yeah. Um, so it's. Uh, I mean, that's what the scripture says. It really. There's a very strong suggestion that the image and the likeness has something to do with kingship, with being God's regent on earth. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned Chrysostom because uh, somebody who was a friend of Chrysostom's. I, I did my dissertation on Theodore of Mopsuestia, who was a friend of John Chrysostom. Um, who uh, was probably the same Theodore who talked Chrysostom into going back when Chrysostom was ready to quit the priesthood at one point. Um, he, uh, he really did fascinating things with this concept of the image of God. And you know, he said, it's, it's got to be visible or else it can't be an image. Right? That's, the, that's the first thing of an image. It's got to be visible. If you can't see it, it can't represent anything. <laughs> you know, an image has intellectual content, but it also has to have a body or else you don't see it. And he said, um, man was set as a, sort of a, as a cultic statue in the creation so that all parts of the creation could be bound together by turning toward God and worshiping God in the person of man. That is that the angels who always serve God, sure, they always serve God, but God doesn't need anything. <laughs> God does not need anything from the angels. They cannot serve him in the full sense because he needs nothing. He lacks nothing. But he has them serve men. He has them, you know, the, the New Testament says that they, that they work for the, uh, for the good of the elect um, to, you know, to bring them to glory and to protect them and all that. Uh, and Theodore also had the understanding that you know, a lot of natural forces were actually angels working. You know, like the physical, the heavenly bodies are moved by angels and the winds are moved by angels and all, everything in nature that moves and you don't know why it's moving because it doesn't have a soul is probably moved by an angel. So he had that in mind too. The angels do all these things to serve us and in serving us, they are serving God. And then the creatures, the brute animals that have no intellect at all and cannot find God and worship him properly, they can serve us. Even if it's only because we forced them to by domestication and whatnot, they serve us. And in serving us, they render their proper due to their creator also in a way that they couldn't if we didn't domesticate them. And so in, in, this, in, in his understanding of creation and fall, uh, it, creation was like for a day. <laughs> this beautiful edifice with man as the image of God binding heaven and earth and all things together into one. And when he fell, it 
splintered the world, the whole cosmos. And the angels didn't want to serve him anymore because he was evil now. And um, he had to assert himself by brute force over the beasts instead of actually being a proper king. And uh, this, was only full, uh, this was only rectified by their getting uh, Christ to be the image to replace man. Christ is the perfect image that all visible things can turn to and say, there, I shall worship God in this direction. I shall face Christ to worship him. And uh, he remakes the human race so that the human race is the way it was meant to be originally, binding earth and heaven together. Yes? Um, we're taking on the loss of authority. We would you mean authority over the animals or authority over the spirits? Authority or, or like authority over evil spirits? Well, Jesus gave his apostles authority over evil spirits, right? And then they came back and they were really excited about this. And he told them... Yeah. Yes, I, I rebuked the spirit and it left! You know, like a kid with a new toy. <laughs> and Jesus said, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Um, you know, I think maybe... Uh, that that's something you have to keep in mind. You have to keep that particular exchange in mind anytime you're dealing with this question, lest you should uh, you know, be uh, seeking occult power by some sort of uh, magic prayer or something. But you know, the, the uh, apostles, they cast out demons, right? They, they did cast out demons in the name of Jesus. Well, the principle of, 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 the, of the nature being renewed, um, when, you, when, you're, when you're baptized into Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, um, you're, you're, you're implanted into Christ, and you begin to share in his new life. That new image comes into you at that point. But the, uh, the old image is still strong. Um, the, the, Adam is, uh, the Adam, the one that sins, is still strong within you. And so you don't get the fullness of that image until the old Adam is dead, and you're raised with Christ in the perfect image and likeness of Christ. Um, so in this life, we do get to experience the, uh, the beginnings of renewal and regeneration, um, um, new, new spiritual powers and desires and such. Uh, but you know, as the formula of Concord says, we always cooperate with the Holy Spirit in great weakness because we still carry about this body of the flesh. And... Um, yeah, I think uh, the, the question of when we get that power in a definitive way, like that, that it's really ours and we can be confident in it, is, is in the resurrection, where, you, where there's no chance of falling ever again. All right, we have somebody standing at the mic, too. Okay, go ahead. Uh, real quickly, because we're getting close to the time, what was it that prompted you to make this an issue? Or was there something? Was there something that prompted you to make this a, an issue? Well, you know, I'd, I'd studied the fathers a lot, and I liked what they had to say about the image of God. And uh, you know, especially the Theodore. When I was doing my dissertation, I was just fascinated by that. And uh, you know, then I read in the Lutheran Confessions that the image of God had been lost, and I was like, what? And so, you know, I was in my confessions class. I went to Professor Ziegler after the class, and I said, what about this? You know, I sort of understand it with this image and likeness thing. And he says, well, the, uh, the Orthodox theologians did recognize that there was a proper sense and a wider sense of talking about the image of God. And so ever since then, I thought, well, I need to look into that, see what it is, so I can understand, so I can understand this and, and how the Maya... Uh, following the fathers in this particular point is, uh, doesn't lead me into violating the uh, Lutheran confessions. 
So that's, that's why I was interested in doing this research. Yes? Yeah, uh, uh, comments that I'd like you to, to talk to if you, if you can, uh, pardon the kind of rambling uh, connections here. Uh, we uh, read at Compline on Wednesday at Exodus, and Moses is going up on the mountain with uh, uh, Nadab and Abihu and, um, and Aaron and the elders and the, um, the sapphire sees God. And, and I'm reminded here, when I was reading that, it was, it was interesting. I said, well, this is heaven. He's going to, I mean, this is a little, a picture of heaven, and this is sent up the mountain. And then um, I was just thinking as we were going through this image and likeness that, um, when I was saying Paul, I believe it is, who says that uh, we do not know what will be yet, but we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And that there's, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about how we, we don't see, we don't see Christ. We don't have a Christ in front of us. And uh, yet we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And we will be in the presence of God, Moses on the mountain and, and that as well. I just wonder if you had any thoughts on that. And especially now I'm going to be Lutheran because um, of the presentation that we receive Christ in the body and blood of Christ in the communion. Yeah. And seeing how this is, this is kind of, uh, uh, there's a... Um, I don't, want to, I don't want to say image and likeness like a stick figure because we're receiving the real thing. Yeah, well, we are the stick figures and we're being fleshed out. <laughs> yeah, okay, right, yeah. What, what, what we are receiving. We receive the real thing to be more like it. Yeah, I was really drawn in when you were talking about Theodore Matsuesta and, and this, this, uh, how that image... Um, It has to be visible. Mm -hmm. And so this is all these things that I'm thinking about as, as we come in um, into the divine service and we receive Christ. How do we see him? How do we see him if he's not mm -hmm. visible? And yet he is visible. Yeah, he's made, he's, he's made visible for us uh, in a sacrament. Um, and of course, we don't actually see him as he is. We see him under the form of, of bread and wine. But yeah, it's, it's the only way we can see him at this point. Yes? So is there any relation to, between the image of God and like iconography and the Roman Catholic and these kinds of Orthodox churches? And if so, does that have any significance at all to the Lutheran tradition? Um, yes, it is. It is related because it's related to the Incarnation. Um, icons, icons were defended in, uh, you know, in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church in the eighth century, and um, you know, also accepted in uh, the, in Lutheranism because uh, the image of God actually did become visible. Actually, did become a man. You know, we 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 are not to depict God according to our own ideas. We are not to depict God according to our own concepts. Um, the command against graven images in the Old Testament, this would be an abomination. But God became a man. And God actually became a man, somebody that we can see, somebody that we can identify with, uh, who is uh, like us in all ways except without sin, and uh, was crucified. He was put on the cross, and when we see somebody on the cross, yeah, we don't know like what Jesus looked like. You know, we could show a picture of Jesus, and you wouldn't recognize it just like Abraham Lincoln, unless it happened to look just like the Sunday school pictures by some by some crazy uh, coincidence. You would not recognize it, but you see him on a cross. You don't say, "Oh, who is that on the cross?" You know who it is on the cross. This is an icon, right? This is an image. This confesses that God was made flesh. For us, you don't say, who is that man? That man is Jesus Christ. Yes, lots of other people were crucified, but we don't make images of him, of them. Um, just like the stick figure with the top hat and the beard is obviously Abe Lincoln. This is obviously Christ. And, you, and you, this would be purely our own imagination and our own uh, self-worship, vaunting itself against God, violating the Ten Commandments, if God hadn't done it first. If God had not, in fact, become a man so that we can confess that. And uh, 
and that is bound up in, you know, in the image of God, that he, uh, we were made according to his image, and then he became our image in order that we could become his image again. And the image could be all that it was meant to be in the first place.